Okay, uh, hello to everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Today we're very happy to have Rob Tielemans, who is going to tell us, explain to us how the dark bubble should slide on quantum cosmology. So Rob, take it away. Oh, yeah, thank you. So I'm Rob, uh, and thanks to Aiden and Felipe for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure that I can speak about some uh, recent work together with Ulf Danielson and Daniel Panizzo from Uppsala and uh, Thomas van Riet from Leuven. So I will speak about kind of emerging between two ideas. That is uh, the dark bubble model, the cosmological model, and uh, quantum cosmology, which is a field that still has some unresolved problems. <clears throat> so basically, I will be talking about uh, the difference between a plus sign and a minus sign. I think that's the punchline of my talk. Now, also, before I start, uh, let me say that I know that my Wi-Fi here is not really, really good. So if things are not understandable or if I'm lagging or something, then please interrupt me such that then, uh, then I can clarify things if needed. And also, if you have questions, uh, please interrupt me and ask. Okay, so first, first I will motivate slash review some things of quantum cosmology. And then I will turn to uh, the dark bubble model, motivate it, outline it. And uh, then I will try to convince you that the dark bubble model can teach us something about quantum cosmology. But let me start by quantum cosmology. Okay, what's quantum cosmology? The name is already a, a spoiler. It's emerging between quantum mechanics and cosmology. And cosmology, as, as you of course know, it tends to describe the evolution of the universe. So today we see a universe that is expanding and we see all sorts of structures, galaxies, clusters, etc. So the question is, how did we end up here? And I think this is very well described by just standard lambda CDM model. Uh, and you can trace back the evolution of our universe to really early time, so even before the CMB uh, was formed. But if you tend to go even, even further back in time, uh, then you will enter the era of inflation, or at least that's what many people believe. Now, why is inflation a good thing? Well, it widens the class of possible initial conditions that you can have. Okay, some initial condition that you can have initial condition can have a wide set of initial conditions to eventually evolve to the universe uh, as we know it. Now, inflation widens that class, but you still cannot have any kind of initial conditions somewhere over here. So you still have to face the question, what is the initial condition before inflation? But where does this story bring us? <clears throat> Well, we are basically trying to understand the universe here at some tremendously high energy scale. Probably you can no longer, uh, you can no longer uh, ignore the effects of quantum gravity here. So at some point, as you know, GR breaks down here. But if you think of string theory as quantum gravity, then maybe the extra dimensions should come into play here. And uh, your 4D effective description breaks down. And even inflation might already be pushing a 4D theory to its limits. Okay, but to be honest, I think we need to say that we just don't know yet how the universe behaves at its very earliest moments. And this is what I try to represent by the blue blob. Okay, we don't know how the universe initiated. Okay, but I think what should be clear is that this is a question that should be asked within the framework of uh, quantum gravity. But still, we do not have a full and accepted theory of quantum gravity. So what quantum cosmology then tries to do is to get hints from quantum gravity, whatever that theory might be. And how it does it? Well, it canonically quantizes GR. So you just quantize a classical theory. You quantize matter, you quantize gravity. Of course, you should not see it as true quantum gravity, okay? It's not that ambitious. Although people called it quantum gravity in the early days, it certainly is not, okay? It uses a canonical formalism based on GR alone, and we know GR is not UV complete. So it can a priori not capture aspects of UV gravity. Okay, but this is also the reason why one seldomly works beyond the semi-classical approximation of quantum cosmology, okay? The idea is that whatever the theory of quantum gravity may be, it should be in its semi-classical limit, agree with the semi-classical limit of quantum cosmology. So quantum cosmology tries to get hints from quantum gravity. And the basic question in quantum cosmology is, can we understand the universe in some quantum mechanical way? So what you need is some kind of a Schrodinger equation. In quantum cosmology, this is called the wheeler de Witt equation. GR gives you a Hamiltonian, H, and this becomes an operator if you do quantization. And then you introduce a quantum state of the universe, we'll call it Psi. 
And this psi gives you the amplitude that the universe contains some three space, a three surface, three hypersurface sigma three, some three metric G, and a certain metric field configuration psi, psi phi. Okay, in a more strict sense, you should regard psi as a wave function now, not as a wave function. So it's not defined on a configuration space as you would have in quantum mechanics, but it's rather defined what people call a super space. So intuitively, this is just the space of all three geometries. Okay, and then the reason why this Hamiltonian should annihilate uh, the wave function or the wave function now is because of diffeomorphism invariance of GR. Okay, it's something that you can expect. So, okay, the task of quantum cosmology is then pretty straightforward. Find Psi. Okay, now uh, with this wave equation, <clears throat> there are two important comments uh, I should make. So first of all, it's a differential equation. So to find a unique Psi, you need boundary conditions. And usually in quantum mechanics, they are fixed by the experiment, okay, by something that is external. Okay, but what's external to our universe? And to be honest, we don't really know what the boundary conditions are. We are actually trading kind of one problem for the other, the problem of initial conditions for finding uh, boundary conditions. And there are several ideas in the literature what these boundary conditions should look like. And they are either based on uh, mathematical consistency or argued for by physical principles or so. But in my opinion, I think it should be the physics and in particular the UV completion of gravity that decides this. And the second remark I wanted to make is about this whole procedure. Aren't you just quantizing the big stuff, okay, the universe? And shouldn't quantum mechanics be about the small stuff? Are you supposed to do it? Uh, well, uh, yes. And I think I think I can explain it with a very simple analogy. Uh, and that's just the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So you know what? This is inherently a quantum mechanical system, just like the electron in a hydrogen atom. And quantum mechanically, the Earth can take, in principle, any orbit. But for the quantum state that the Earth is in, the probability is just very high that it follows an orbit as dictated by the classical laws. So classical dynamics is more an approximation to quantum mechanics in this specific sp uh, situation. And uh, you should also think like this in the case of quantum cosmology. Quantum mechanics is fundamental, so there is no problem in quantizing the universe. But the wave function should, of course, among other things, predict that space-time is classical. So I'm not going to go much into this. I just wanted to make clear there is indeed a point in uh, quantizing a cosmology. What I do want to go into is this issue about uh, boundary conditions. And uh, for the specific example or the specific formula of this uh, bubble model, uh, it will be sufficient that I explain you one on a very simple toy model. And in this toy model, I will just consider uh, an FLRW metric. Uh, the spatial slices here uh, are just uh, positively curved, so they are spheres. So the omega-3 is the metric on the tree sphere, A is the scale factor, and N is a uh, lapse function. The lapse function has no physical significance, it's just a gauge choice. What it does is it makes a uh, time reparameterization invariance and makes it manifest. That's the freedom that you have to choose tau. Now I will just fill this universe with a positive cosmological constant lambda. And then the dynamics is fully determined by the Einstein-Hilbert action. And also note that I have put my gravitational constant equal to one, just as for the notation of simplicity. And let me first look at the classical behavior of this cosmology. Now, if you plug in this uh, metric into the Einstein-Hilbert action, you just compute the Ricci scalar, then you find something like this. So maybe it's good to keep this in the back of your head. And the omega tree here is just the volume of the tree sphere. Uh, I don't like this to take it with me, so I will just get rid of it. I will not write it. It does not change the physics field. But this, this is just uh, classical mechanics. Okay, you have a kinetic term, you have a potential term, something that you can analyze. So you have a reaction with respect to n and with respect to a, and you find the equations of motion. And these are simply the first and second Friedman equations. Okay, I will not write out the second one. Okay, it's just a redundant one. It's just the time derivative of uh, the first here. And the first Friedman equation is just a statement of energy conservation. This is really simple to show. Just compute the Hamiltonian, follow the st standard procedure, doing a Legendre transform. And if you all do this, uh, what you find is that the canonical Hamiltonian 
is equal to the lapse function n multiplying this curly h. And this curly h is uh, just what is here in brackets. This p is the momentum that is conjugal to a, your scale factor. Now, that the reason that an n appears here, okay, this is just uh, that the lapse function enforces energy conservation. So pairing the action with respect to n basically gives you h is equal to zero. And this is something you could, of course, have expected. Okay, you can expect that the Hamiltonian vanishes in a theory that is invariant under time reparameterizations. And I will now call this a curly h, I would call it the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now you can solve the classical equations of motion, and I think that uh, everyone will know the solution, or at least conceptually. So in the proper time gauge, n is equal to one, uh, tau measures cosmic time, and then the scale factor here just goes like a, a cosh. So uh, the scale factor, um, sorry, the universe is just a tree sphere that is expanding exponentially. Okay, but the important thing to note is that you cannot crush down your universe all the way down to zero size. There is a minimum size of the universe and that's just given by the square root of three over lambda. Okay, that's its initial size and then it expands. Or can you make a quantum theory out of this? Well, of course you can. Okay, you just follow the Hux prescription and turn the Hamiltonian into an operator acting on state. This is just canonical quantization. So what you do, you turn the momentum into a derivative operator. The next ingredient you need is a quantum state and an equation that it satisfies. So this quantum state or the wave function of the universe, psi, it will be a function of the scale factor only. Okay, that's the only degree of freedom that I have. And people often call this drastic cut in degrees of freedom a uh, mini superspace. So you only look at the scale factor. And the equation that psi should satisfy is something that you obtain by just stirring the classical constraint, h not equal to uh, h equal to zero. You just turn it into an operator equation. So h acting on psi is zero. So what you now get is a Schrödinger equation, and in the context of cosmology, as I told you, this is something that you call the wheel of the Witt equation. But in fact, uh, it's just a Schrödinger equation in some potential uh, v. And that potential it looks like this. So it starts at zero, it goes up, and then it goes down. And I think you can recognize two regions separated by a turning point here. So on the right, you have this classically allowed region. The wave function will typically oscillate. And on the left, you have this uh, quantum region or classically forbidden region where the wave function will typically display some exponential behavior. And of course, this value of this turning point, the square root of three over lambda is something that you encountered before. It was the minimum size of our universe. And, and this makes sense. Classically, your universe cannot get any smaller, but quantum mechanically, well, it might. So what this means is that our universe, it can nucleate out of nothing. Okay, there is an instant ton that describes this tunneling event from zero scale factor all the way to your turning point, and once nucleated, your universe just evolves classically. Okay. Now this picture is often thrown at you in uh, the quantum cosmology uh, literature. Literature. So there's an instant ton describing the tunneling event from nothing, a state that has no notion of space, no notion of time, and then after nucleation, universe starts at rest and then expands. Now this was a really conceptual picture. I did not solve. Uh, the real of the width equation. But can we do it? Can we find solutions to this? Well, of course, uh, you can. And as I mentioned, in quantum cosmology, we do not go beyond the semi classical approximation. So I will just look for solutions to the wave equation that are of this WKB form. So this means in the under barrier, I will look for exponential solutions, exponent of S. And in the classical region, I will look for oscillatory solutions. So uh, exponent of i times s, give, take, give or take a sign. And this s is a typical uh, WKP integral. Okay, you integrate the square root of your potential from the turning point to a. And these coefficients a, b, c, and d, they are just related to, uh, to each other through the WKP connection formula. So you basically glue the solutions across a turning point. So give it a choice a, b in the quantum region, you can construct the wave function in the classical region and vice versa. So I have found a solution to the wheel of the width equation, but of course this is by no means a unique solution. Okay, which values are A, B or C and D should I take? I still need to fix my boundary conditions and this is what we don't know. And in the literature there are two common proposals, uh, namely the Vilenkin proposal or the tunneling proposal. Uh, 
and the Hartle Hawking or No Boundary proposal. And they really have formal definitions for them, but I will just focus on what they mean for this specific model in mini superspace. And let me start with this most intuitive one, the Vilenkian proposal or the tunneling proposal. And it's really similar to what you know from alpha decay. You impose that at large A here, your wave function only has outgoing modes. So that means your universe is tunneling out, actually. So this amount of setting C equal to zero, you only keep the outgoing modes here. Okay, so we'll then have a wave function, or at least the real part that looks like this. Okay, it's peaked around zero scale factor, it decreases through the barrier, and then it oscillates. The proposal of Hartle and Hawking, on the other hand, uh, is to set A equal to zero. So you only consider the increasing exponential in the under barrier region, and then it starts oscillating. Question so for the Hartle Hawking. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, <clears throat> just about the. Um the vertical axis so so we had the schrodinger equation h psi equals 0 and is mm -hmm. uh is 0 the the axis here so so the potential starts at 0 or is it something else uh, this sorry, this point you mean yeah this point is that is that yeah, zero? this is this is v equal to 0 yes okay so in the in the quantum mechanics um problem then then that's the that's the energy so it, it wouldn't yes you have zero energy it wouldn't have yes. some sort of metastable thing in in the left side it's okay no, thank no, you it is. so for this hartle hawking boundary condition uh, you only take the increasing exponential and the wave function starts oscillating after the barrier and uh, what's nice about this hartle hawking wave function is that it's real everywhere if you like real things okay Okay, so now I will choose a normalization for those wave functions. I still have that freedom. And I will choose a normalization that they have the same value at A equal to zero. And then by comparing the amplitudes at large A, I uh, will get an idea about the nucleation probability. Okay, what's the probability that the universe nucleates? And for the Vilenkin uh, boundary condition, you will find that this nucleation probability is proportional to the exponent of minus one over lambda. And C is just some, uh, this small C here is just a numerical constant I don't want to show. And for the Hartle Hawking proposal, you find that the nucleation probability scales as the exponent of plus one over lambda. And the sign difference here is really crucial. Okay, it gives you a completely different behavior. So a very naive interpretation is that the Hartle Hawking uh, wave function predicts that the universe with a very small cosmological constant is more probable to nucleate while Vilenkin it predicts the opposite. Of course, I'm not really a big fan of this formulation for two simple reasons. Okay, you don't have a measure on the space of cosmological constants, and there's also not an obvious dynamics that changes lambda. Okay, so take this with a grain of salt. And I know, okay, there's much more to say about quantum cosmology, but I think what I explained now is uh, the basics, and I think it's uh, sufficient to understand the, uh, the dark bubble model, or at least what we did with the dark bubble model. So let me give you a quick recap about quantum cosmology. So I hope I convinced you that this wave function of the universe kind of predicts that the whole universe can nucleate out of nothing. And the reason why these universes should be closed is really simple. Okay, you cannot nucleate something that's infinitely large. But the difficulty in this approach of quantum cosmology is that you must specify some boundary conditions. And this is something that we don't know. We don't know what they are. And I think it's fair to say that it is the UV completion of gravity that determines them. And since we don't know the UV completion, we don't know the boundary conditions. So let us remain a little ignorant or agnostic and say we have two choices. That's either Vilenkin or Hartle Hawking. And they each give you a different weighting as I defined here. Okay, and it's just an issue of a plus or minus sign. And I know there are some uh, recent developments regarding uh, Vilenkin and Hartle Hawking. And let me not tell you anything about it. Uh, let me just stick with these definitions. Okay, this is what Vilenkin and what Hartle Hawking originally had in mind. Now, if you want to, to know more, I think these are two really good uh, references to look at. Okay. Okay, so this finishes my discussion of quantum cosmology. Yes. Yeah, sure. Can I ask a question? Uh, I, I don't want to derail the discussion too much, but this is something that always confused me. Uh, this boundary condition is an initial condition. So normally for a dynamical system, you have a complete set of initial condition that specify which state you're in. There's no issue of uniqueness. 
I mean, some of them are simpler states than others. Some of them might be regarded as vacuum or maximum symmetric state or something. But normally in a dynamical system, you have a complete set of states and each one of them will have a specific initial condition. So I never understand this idea of, you know, there is some unique state. There's no dynamical state. There's no dynamical system with unique states initially. So well, I'm not sure if I understand your question. So um, what, what's the thing that confused you? So you, well, you're, you're confused okay. that the boundary condition is yeah. what? Well, I mean, uh, if you regard that as a dynamical system that starts at some early time and then evolves to the current time, then there's going to be any initial condition that you want. And again, some of them will be simpler than others, but normally in a dynamical system, there's a complete set of uh, initial conditions that you can impose at any point in time. Uh, so I, 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 I don't yes. understand why this system is any different. But, Why you kind of uh, imagine there's a correct choice for an initial state? Well, um, I'm I'm just looking at boundary conditions for a, a Schrodinger equation, right? I think most question is about uh, what is the Hilbert space associated to that universe. I mean, here it's a ah, okay. still in that he's saying h equals zero should be a constraint. So at least yes, it, it is. Uh, it is a yes. Um, Maybe I'm not sure, but maybe this is related to the problem of time in cosmology. So you, you, this h equal to zero turns to an operator equation, and naively you would expect that uh, the Hamiltonian is uh, the time derivative of your state, but you don't have the notion of time here. I'm not sure if this answer or at any sense makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is orthogonal to the talk, so I'll just let you continue. But, yeah. Okay, maybe we can discuss afterwards if you want. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me then go to the second part of my talk, um, which is um, about brain worlds. Yeah, okay, we can go. Now, before I can go to this uh, brain world model or the bubble, the dark bubble model, let me first tell you something about the brain worlds. So, of course, this well established that our universe contains more than four dimensions, and we only see four. So you must come up with a way to hide them. And there are two common ideas, as you know, you either compactify the extra dimensions to a very small size, that was the idea of Kaluza and Klein, or you say, well, you're just stick to a membrane that is embedded in some uh, higher dimensional space. Okay, so in these conceptual pictures, uh, the blue arrow represents uh, the part of the space to which you have access as an observer, and the red arrows or the red direction, uh, it represents, well, basically the direction to which you do not have access to. Okay, so uh, the curling up of an extra dimension or escaping the membrane uh, is something that you, you can do. I will not focus on these Kaluza Klein compactifications. I will just focus on this brain world scenario. Now, why are these brain worlds interesting? Our brains, they are non perturbative solutions in QFT. They even for free in string theory. So they are actually really, really natural objects to consider. And the dark bubble model that I will discuss in a minute, I think it will make this point also really clear. So the original idea of a brain world was to put a very simple membrane in ADS. I'll just uh, look at ADS5. And I'll introduce a coordinate that measures how far I am away from the brain. And this A. It, uh, it describes how strong my geometry is warped as I move away from the brain. So for this reason, it's called uh, the warp factor. The first model of uh, Randall and Sundrum, it considered just a flat brain uh, in ADS. And later, Karch and Randall generalized this to the sitter or anti sitter brains in ADS. But now for any case, I can uh, conceptually show you what this warp factor should look like, at least sufficiently close to the brain. And it looks like this. Okay, so the blue represents the brain. And for simple ADS, the warp factor would just be uh, an increasing exponential. Okay, but since there is a membrane, it experiences a kink and it decays again. And it's this kind of strong warping that basically will prevent your particles from spreading out into the extra dimension. It allows to localize your stuff. Now you see the same geometry on either side of the brain, right? It's just the ADS in which you put your brain. 
But now if you want to try to exit ADS from here, you will just enter it again. So the brain basically glues an inside of ADS to an inside of ADS. So for this reason, this is called an inside-inside construction. Okay, it's the same ADS space. Now the main question now is, can you realize this in string theory? Can you realize the compactification of Kaluz and Klein, or can you realize uh, these brain world scenarios like Randall and Sundar or Randall? Can you realize them in string theory? Well, I think we don't know. Okay? Apparently, finding in the central vacuum as a pure compactification. That's, that's really difficult. And maybe these things might even be in this homeland. And well, to my knowledge, we have not found a realization of a Handel uh, syndrome like brain world with an inside inside construction in string theory. So, what this dark bubble model now tries to do is it tries to provide a model of a sitter space that could be embedded in string theory. And it's a little thinking outside the box. It abandons this paradigm of finding a time independent vacuum. And I think it's even better motivated than looking for these pure de Sitter compactifications or these uh, inside inside brain worlds. So let me first discuss how people came up with this idea and importantly, why we think it could be uh, a model that is realizable within string theory. But if you are interested, uh, this paper is the one that first proposed the dark bubble model. And the second one is a really nice essay, which conceptually discusses and motivated the model. So it's actually really worth reading. Okay, so what have we learned from string theory? Well, uh, finding the sitter appears to be very difficult, but anti the sitter, it seems to be all over the place. Okay, so say you just have an ADS space, take ADS5. Okay, what have we learned from the Swampland program? Well, well, we've learned that these ADS spaces that are non supersymmetric, those are believed to be unstable as a consequence of the weak gravity conjecture. ADS, it can decay. And it typically happens through bubble nucleation. So all of a sudden, a bubble of a different ADS space can nucleate. I will use a notation with a minus sign to denote quantities on the inside of the bubble and a plus sign to denote quantities on the outside of the bubble. Okay, okay but bubble nucleation, that's something that we understand pretty well. Okay, this is described by the Brown title by instanton. And the cosmological constant on the inside is always smaller than the cosmological constant on the outside. Okay, or smaller, I mean more negative. Okay, so you decay to a lower energy configuration. The only thing that you need is a brain that can mediate this decay. Okay, then this bubble, it nucleates, it nucleates at rest, and it will then expand. It will accelerate and eat up all of this false ADF5. Now it is this accelerated expansion that will make the bubble wall look like a 4D the sitter space. Okay, and the, the claim of the dark bubble model is then that this bubble is our universe. And I think what is really powerful about this bubble model is that everything what happens on the brain, so things we can say about our universe, will find an interpretation in the bulk. And the main difference with the brain wells that I have discussed on the previous slides, like uh, Handel and Sundrum, is that this nucleation requires an inside outside construction. Okay, so there are no two insides. Okay, so what I've tried to argue for here is that there may be a natural string theory embedding of these sitter brain wells that is fully inspired by this uh, swampland logic. But okay, to remain honest, we have not found one, okay? But I think this could be a really, really promising direction. Okay, setting that aside, I think there are really interesting questions you can ask already. And the ones I will be interested in will relate to what I have been discussing before, namely cosmology. Will an observer on the brain indeed see a universe as we see it? And can we also understand this nucleation event? And if you combine those two, I think you'll obviously touch the framework of quantum cosmology uh, that I have described before. Question? Yes. Um, can you remind me what what does the global picture of, of such a space time look like? What happens to this brain? And if, if I have an ambient, um, I, I guess we're picturing a global ADS, and then maybe this. Yes. And you have a bubble, it nucleates, and then it expands, eating up all of ADS. And and it reaches the ADS boundary in in some finite ADS time is or what what happens? Um, yes, I think so. It or it, or it, well. If you are living on the brain, it takes an infinite amount of uh, proper time, basically. Yeah? But it, it, it expands 
fully algorithmed, eats all of this ADS5 plus. So I'm wondering from the field theory point, I mean, supposing that we have, um, uh, imagine a, a global ADS scenario where the ADS time corresponds to a time in some field theory, which maybe is a non-supersymmetric um, conformal field theory. So does the, uh, from the point of view of this global ADS time, does the de Sitter brain reach the boundary at a finite time? Yes, yes, I think okay. so, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so from, from the field theory point of view, um, then the interpretation would be um, some kind of phase transition or something that happens at everywhere at, at the same time. And then you go to some supersymmetric vacuum, or is that? Uh, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. thank you. Let's make a quick set. OK, <clears throat> so now I can move on. And I want to try to outline uh, the basic features of this uh, dark bubble model. Now, as I told you, it is an inside outside construction. And the inside of the bubble and the outside, it's just ADS. Okay, and I'll write my cosmological constant just as a minus six K squared. So K is the energy scale of ADS. And this K inside bigger than K outside just means you decay to an, an ADS space with a more negative cosmological constant. Okay, I will write ADS in global coordinates and Z will give me the distance away from the center. Okay. I just, you describe this bubble by giving its position. So Z equals to a function A of tau and tau is some time parameter on the brain. Okay, that's why I just drew a clock here. Now you then compute the induced metric. And what you see is that these first two terms that involve F just collapse to the lapse function. So the induced metric is now of the F W form. So nice. And there's one interesting comment that I wanted to make. And that is, if you change the bulk by changing f, okay, the induced geometry would feel it through its lapse function. So it would feel it through its time coordinate. Time will run different. So basically, changing f will affect okay, something you can expect. It will affect the cosmic evolution. And I will come back to this later. So the main question is, can this membrane, can it describe our universe? Of course, you need several things to answer this question. But what you really must have is Einstein's gravity. Okay. And people have shown this. Uh, people have shown that you can project the 5D Einstein equation onto the brain and find back 4D Einstein, 4D Einstein gravity. The only thing that you must do is to identify the gravitational constant in four and five dimensions uh, as here. Now, okay, you get 4D gravity. So what you can expect is that the evolution in 5D. Uh, hi, Rob. Can I ask a question here? Oh, hey, so, yes. yes, so what is the initial setup that you have in mind before projection? Do you have a 5D uh, gravitational action plus a 4D gravitational action with dynamics or you start only with a five dimensional, let's say gravitational action and you just try to find some induced dynamics on the brain? Uh, sorry, can you repeat it quickly? Uh, so wh let's say, what, what, is your, what is your original action that you, have, that you think about this system? You have both a 5D gravitational action and a, a gravitational action on the brain, or just a 5D action and on the brain, you just have, I don't know, you, you think of some curvature term. I or... think that my next slide will answer your question. Oh, okay. I think so. If it's not, then interrupt me again. Okay. 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 okay so, um, well, I was actually just planning to move on to the next slide. Uh, I was going to tell uh, that this, well, what you get from 4D gravity is that you can expect that this bubble is. Um, the devolution of the bubble is described by Friedman equation. So let us see if we can understand this uh, classical dynamics in 5D. And this dynamics is, as usual, it is determined by uh, the Einstein-Hilbert term. It is determined by brain action. Sigma is the brain tension. Gamma is the induced metric on the brain. And a given hawking York boundary term. Okay, it, does this answer your question? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. And one okay. question. Okay, maybe maybe you will also discuss this. Are you going to find the the wave function for the full system or only for the brain for for the four dimensional for the? I will find uh, the nucleation amplitude. Okay. I will relate the amplitudes. Okay. okay. 
Okay, so this is the action that determines my dynamics in 5D. It's kind of a procedure to compute this. So I will just show the result and probably it, it won't either say much because it's rather an ugly expression. So sorry in advance for showing it, but anyhow, uh, here it is. So this is a rather complicated thing and this plus minus minus plus thing means evaluate the quantity for the inside, subtract the same quantity, but evaluate it for the outside, okay? Well, it looks complicated, but in fact, it's just classical mechanics. But of course, if you just show it to your students, they probably run away and maybe never come back, actually for no reason. Okay. Recall this N. It was just a lapse function that enforced energy conservation. So if I vary my action with respect to N, I know everything. So I do so, and what I find is my Hamiltonian constraint. And it's just an energy balance. Okay, it relates the brain energy, so the brain tension. It relates it to an energy difference inside versus outside. Okay, if you don't like this approach of going to the action, uh, you could also just compute Israel's equation. Okay, the jump and extrinsic curvature. This is just uh, the junction condition. Okay, you can choose. It's the same thing. So this equation it tells you how the bubble moves. So let me write it in a more suggestive form. So as a Friedman equation, exactly as I promised that we should get. So I'll write the double rate as this uh, upright H, so not an italic H to confuse with the Hamiltonian. So the Hubble rate is, as you expect, a curvature term and a cosmological constant term. And this cosmological constant, lambda 4, is the 4D vacuum energy. That's what you, as a 4D observer, would measure. And it's a rather complicated function of the brain tension and the ADS scale. So let me not give it, but let me just plot it. And it looks like this. So you can identify two branches that are separated by the minimum. And only one branch is consistent with having an inside-outside construction. Okay. And then you see there's also a critical value for which the, um, uh, the cosmological constant lambda 4 vanishes. And this critical brain tension is just given by the um, difference in ADS scales. Okay, now take a look at the Friedman equation. Okay, what you really easily can see is that this does not admit, admit any real solution for A if lambda four is negative. So all of this is not a physical interest. So what this all means is that a nucleation event guarantees that your 4D cosmological constant must be positive. Okay, that's the only option you have. Now, phenomenologically, what are the kind of setups that we're after? Well, first of all, our universe does not seem to be curved very much. So we don't like this uh, minus one over a squared, this curvature term here. Now, this is something that you don't see in the limit where k times a is really big. So when the bubble is really large. So, well, then our universe. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, Could sure. you just remind us, um, like from the perspective of the 5D theories, what are the free parameters that we get to choose here? Like uh, of like say the, like the ADS uh, like the, the the two ADS curvatures the brain tension things like that what are yes. what are the independent parameters? Uh, you can choose the uh, ADS scales so mm -hmm. k uh, minus k plus. Uh, basically, you can also choose the brain tension sigma, and then this uh, Hamiltonian constraint will tell you how the brain moves. Okay. Rob, can, can I ask also something a bit related? So in some sense, you don't consider the back reaction of the brain on the ambient space time, right? You, you fix your ambient space time and then you just consider the, just the dynamics of the brain, right? There's no back reaction problem solved. I mean, I'm so trying to understand how, how the 5D metric is fixed. You have already somehow, or, or it's dynamical also. Yeah, I think, I think the back reaction problem is a really subtle thing. Um, how do you see yeah, that? that uh but it's fairly symmetric okay, though, okay. so it's probably just junction conditions and... yeah it's just a junction so just, condition that that's okay. that's basically all that's, all there is so it's solving all the equations both the 5d and the 4d that the solution yes. that you're okay so maybe i'll just follow up on aiden's question since we're bothering you and um so in in terms of those parameters the the uh tension and the two ads lengths um maybe can you can you say what is required if you want to get the localized gravity uh, from on the brain? That's also really, that. really subtle, uh, getting localized gravity. I will mention briefly in the conclusion, but um, things are not, gravity is not localized on the brain. Neither is matter. 
it kind of extends holographically into the body. Sure, but if, I mean, if you if you want a, a 4D um, cosmology in, in your effective description, uh, then uh, so so what what do you need to to have in order to get uh, an effective description that looks like four dimensional um, cosmology? I, I guess that's my question. So what what kind of effective description I need for 4D cosmology? Or, so in terms of these these parameters that the brain tension and the uh, the two ADS lengths on either side. So I think in some cases, if, if I had very small tension, I would imagine that, or in, in some cases I would imagine there, there wouldn't be localized gravity. I mean, there, there would be no regime where people on this brain would see 4D gravity. So so what is, the, what is required in order to get um, this localization, this randall syndrome mechanism? But, but you don't have localization in this uh, setup, right? But it, you had a formula for Newton's constant. I mean, you have you have 4D gravity. Otherwise, I think we have 4D gravity, right? And you even had a formula for yes. Newton's constant in, in four dimensions. There is maybe, 4D gravity. Maybe I can say something. I mean, the, the yeah. scales in the game, which which are important, is 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 the tension and it's also the the scales of the ADS. And yeah. the point is that the scale of the ADS, the K, is supposed to be really high energy. So in order to have effective 4D gravity, the energy scales need to be small compared to K so that you don't excite anything in the, in the, in the fifth direction. But the point is, and, and that's something which Rob tried to explain, is that neither matter nor gravity is localized to the brain. So this is a fundamental difference from Randall syndrome. Instead, I don't know if Rob will mention that, for instance, dust particles, I mean, really massive particles will correspond to strings which are stretching in the bulk holographically. Mm -hmm. So you should think of matter like hanging strings, like QCD strings in, in the ADS holography, which are hanging down and then are attached to the, to the bubble. So it's very, very different from, from Randall syndrome. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, it, it's really a matter of the energy scales, because if, the, if you go to too high energy, you will see corrections to, to 4D gravity. But at low energy, one can derive and get exactly Einstein equations, not only for, for cosmology, but also for localized system. You really get Einstein equations from the Young's conditions when you, when, you, when you do it carefully at low energy, but you can also get corrections. Okay. Um, yeah. So maybe in terms of that, I would the I can rephrase to say this this energy scale below which you get localized, uh, you know, 40, 40 effective uh, gravity. Um, can you can you say what that is in terms of? It's, it's a parameter of the model. You can choose this, the ADS scale to whatever you like, but presumably mm. it should be a scale which is beyond TV. It might be close to Planck scale, but it's a free parameter. Okay, and, and you can express it in terms of these other ones that the, the, the brain tension and the ADS length somehow. Well, it's the ADS scale which, is, which sets the oh. scale of the correction. So it's really this okay. K minus or K plus. Okay. which sets the scale of the corrections. And then, of course, you also see the relation between the, the four-dimensional Newton's constant and the five-dimensional Newton's constant and how the, the K is entering to there. By the way, that formula is a great place to see the difference between Randall syndrome and this model, because you had that K minus K plus divided by K minus minus K plus. Hmm. In Randall syndrome, there is a plus sign and all Ks are equal. Okay. And then we just get the K. But here it's more subtle. Great. By the and way, then we're, you see we're, also we're... that the the Rob didn't say that, but the well, he actually did. But you see the, the difference between the critical tension and the actual tension that sets the cosmological constant as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the fine tuning that you need to make. Very good. Okay. By the way, we're we're relaxed on time, so even, even though we're disturbing you, we we would like to hear what you want to get through. Okay, so is everything okay? Can I uh, continue? Okay. Okay, so um, what I was saying is um, that for phenomenological reasons, okay, you don't like this curvature term. So in this 
phenomenological limit, we call it large K. Uh, you don't see this curvature term if the brain is large. So this is this first statement. Uh, so uh, K times A is way bigger than one. And also our universe does not seem to have a cosmological constant that is uh, big. It's rather really, really small. So this means that the brain tension uh, should be close to critical, okay? This epsilon here, it should be very small. Another thing that we require is the fact that you do not see any bulk curvature. I think this is what uh, Ulf was mentioning. Uh, you don't see uh, the bulk curvature within our, our horizon. So um, the Hubble rate, 40 Hubble rate, should be way smaller than uh, the scale set by uh, K, okay? Now, when you read the papers of this bubble model, these limits are often... Uh, assume they are imposed and they simplify a lot. So let us also take these for granted. And for instance, I can now write down in this limit of large K, what the four dimensional cosmological constant should look like. Okay? The 4D vacuum energy should just be the difference between the, the critical brain tension and the brain tension itself. And also this horrible action, the, that's basically the reason I wanted to show this, is that if you impose these limits, it just implodes to the action that you encountered before, okay? This was just this uh, cosmology action. Of course, up to corrections that go like H over K. Okay, so this is what is beyond 4D gravity corrections. You know, this was a bit well, maybe technical or with, with a lot of equations. So let me give you a quick uh, and conceptual overview of the claim that what happens in our universe or what happens on the brain will find an interpretation in the bulk. Okay, so here we have a bubble that is expanding and if you want to know what an observer on the brain feels, uh, you just compute the induced metric and you compute the junction condition, or uh, the, which gives you the Friedman equation. Okay, so JC, junction condition. On the previous slide, I told you that this cosmological constant in 4D finds its interpretation in the bulk as the energy differences amongst uh, the uh, ADS scales and the brain tension. Okay, so the critical brain tension minus the brain tension itself. And this is why it's called the dark bubble model. It gives rise to dark energy in four dimensions. Now, of course, our universe, it's not just the sitter. Okay. So what can we do? I also told you some slides ago, if you touch this function f, then it will basically affect how the bubble moves in the bulk. So you affect cosmic evolution. So let us try something. Let us add a black hole, so I'm adding a black hole. And if you go through the computations, Okay, I'm ignoring some numerical facts. If you go to the computation, what you find is that this, in the Friedman equation, contributes as some uh, radiation density. So a black hole in the bulk means you have radiation on the brain. Now, besides radiation, we also know that we have matter in our universe. So this is what Ulf already mentioned. So in the bulk, dust or pressureless matter corresponds to uh, strings hanging on the brain. So alpha is here the uh, string tension. So this is basically now a, a bubble in a Schwarzschild ADS background in a cloud of strings. And you find that uh, strings give rise to a scaling with an energy density on the brain that goes like one over A cubed. Because the reason it scales differently okay, is because the, the brain, as it expands, kind of eats the energy uh, in the strings. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, you know that there is a cosmological horizon. So this too finds an interpretation in the bulk. It's just a part of the Himmler horizon. And I think this makes sense, right? So but, um, observers on the bubble, they accelerate. And likewise, you can also relate that temperatures. Now I will not go uh, too much into this, just mentioning it, um, but there's something else that I want to talk about. And that's what's beneath this dashed line. So this was more classical uh, stuff. Let us go a bit into quantum stuff and ask ourselves the question, uh, what the Big Bang and this wave function of the universe correspond to in 5D? Now, I think you, you already feel this, right? The Big Bang, so the, the moment the universe comes into existence somehow, uh, that's what should correspond to the nucleation event of the bubble. And the vague concept of wave function of the universe defined on the superspace, well, it, it will just be a quantum mechanical wave function in the end. Let me now try to explain. Rob, Rob, can I ask you? Can I ask you something here? So, does the bubble nucleate behind the horizon or outside the horizon, the five D horizon? I'm trying to understand um, a bit the picture. Uh, the the in the Schwarzschild for the Schwarzschild horizon, the black hole horizon. Yeah, what, uh, what it, does the bubble nucleate? Uh, away from the horizon, so it's larger. So it's always larger than okay. 
Yeah. So let me now tell you or convince you that this dark bubble model uh, can teach you some things about quantum cosmology. So in particular, I will now discuss this uh, nucleation event, and I will also work in this limit of large k. Now, as I explained to you before, the nucleation event is just the decay of a false ADS5. If you think of false vacuum decay, I think you are thinking about Coleman de Lucia. Okay, but in this setup, you don't really have a scalar field that can change the value of the vacuum energy. So what is more appropriate here is the mechanism of a Brown and Teitelbaum, who really describe the decay of a cosmological constant. Okay, now what's their idea? So you do no longer regard the cosmological constant as a God-given number, but you regard it as a five-form field strength. Okay, this is just Hodge duality. And since the five form is a form of top degree, it is proportional to the volume form and the uh, proportionality constant is basically uh, the cosmological constant. Now these four fields, they couple to membranes, as you know, so five form couples to a 4D membrane. And as soon as you induce, introduce a membrane, then this cosmological constant will become dynamical. Well, dynamical, uh, the Bianchi identity tells you that it is constant everywhere, except that the brain, okay? There it can experience a discontinuous jump. And this is also the physical setup that we are after, right? Okay, now how do we achieve such a configuration? Well, as I told you, this is just a first order phase transition. And semi-classically, you can describe this as an instant on tunneling process. So to quantum tunneling, a bubble appears. And this is really similar to why electric fields are quantum mechanically unstable, string pair production. So quantum mechanically, electric fields decay through pair production of electrically charged particles. In this case, a cosmological constant decays through membrane production. Now, this probability for spontaneous membrane creation in the presence of gravity, this has been calculated by Brown and Teitelbaum. So what you do is you just look in that paper and take the equations you need. So imagine that a brain or membrane of radius big R has nucleated. Then this nucleation probability is proportional to the exponent of minus B. And B is called the pound section, and it's given by this. Okay, so A4 is the, vol uh, the um, uh, surface area of the instanton, and V5 is the volume of this instanton. So there is a surface term here, basically what you need to form a membrane, and then there is a term that considers the difference between having a bubble and not having a bubble. Now, this is a really complicated expression, so let me not give it, but let me plot it. And qualitatively, it looks like this. So it increases, reaches a maximum, and then goes down. Now, this is something that you require to be stationary. Okay, so basically you extremize the action. And you find an extremum that is exactly located at the value that we encountered before, the square root of three over lambda. Okay, that was the minimum radius of our 4D universe. Now, if you plug this in, if you compute the value of B here at the extremum, what you find is that B goes like one over lambda. Okay, C is again some numerical constant. Of course, up to some corrections, but in this phenomenological limit, it's really a scaling that goes like one over lambda. Now, what this shows is that we get a weighting that matches the Vilenkin weighting in quantum cosmology, up to some corrections. But this means that the boundary conditions on the wave function should be unambiguously fixed by demanding consistency with physics that we know, the physics of bubble nucleus. And this is something that we understand. About this uh, Vilenkin wave function, I think there are two interesting comments to make. That um, recently it was argued that these could possess some instabilities. Namely, if you include some perturbations uh, in your universe, then the Vilenkin wave function would predict a lot of perturbations. The more, the better. But this is not what should be, right? They should be suppressed. Now, luckily, Vilenkin. Uh, in response, showed that this wave function is actually well behaved, but only if you impose a, a Robin type boundary condition on the perturbation. So, in the end, everything will be fine. So, is this something that you can understand in this dark bubble model? Well, from the 5D point of view, I think it's conceptually clear that there cannot be any instabilities. Okay, all perturbations uh, cost energy, and this nucleation event can, of course, not produce infinitely large perturbations. Okay, there is no reason for why this nucleation event should be invisible. But there's one subtlety. So take a second look at the Friedman equation. Recall that this cosmological constant in four dimensions, lambda four, was given by 
the difference between the critical brain tension and the brain tension. So there's a minus sign over here. So what would happen if I fluctuate my membrane? So by squeezing or, or uh, stretching it. Those things would seem to add energy to the tension, but this would enter as a negative energy density in 4D. So it doesn't this signal instability. Okay. Now what is really subtle here is that you cannot really speak as the, of the brain as a separate entity by itself. Okay. The brain back reacts on the 5D bulk and vice versa. So this means that the fluctuations on the brain should have an uplifted interpretation in the bulk. And when you take properly this back reaction to account to the junction condition, you will find no negative energies in 4D. Okay? You will find no instability, exactly as should be. And this is something that we recently have been looking at. I think it appeared last week on archives. We considered gravitational perturbations. And I think these are the most natural ones. You don't need any additional fields or so. What we did is we constructed the uplift of four-dimensional gravitational waves, so how they would appear in our universe, to 5D. Or what must happen in the 5D geometry, such that on the brain, we will just see our conventional gravitational waves, up to some corrections. And we managed to do this uplift, and this is a really simple picture uh, for a very specific gravitational wave for, with a very specific frequency. Okay, So we solved the 5D wave equation ADS, and we found waves that vanish in the center, so there are no sources inside the bubble. And when Z goes to infinity, they just become our conventional gravitational waves, as I show in blue. And in red, you see the gravitational wave on the brain. So this is basically the brain trajectory. And they are, well, they correspond to gravitational waves on the brain, uh, on, on 4D, but up to H over K corrections. Okay. And if we then properly took into account the back reaction, we showed that these fluctuations give you a net positive energy in the Friedman equation in the form of just radiation and curvature, so no instability. Of course, it would be interesting to see if it's possible to map the mini superspace model with perturbation, so in 4D, onto this dark bubble nucleation event. And there are, of course, many other interesting things you can do with these waves, and in particular with the dark bubble model, because in principle, you have control over beyond 4D gravity corrections, 4D EGR corrections. And two really interesting questions are, wow, how did these uh, gravitational wave modes contribute to the vacuum at the end 40? It would be really interesting to find out. And maybe there are uh, massive 4D waves on the brain, but that uplift to massless gravitational wave in 5D. Briefly outline the main points I wanted to make. So first of all, why do I want to consider this dark bubble? Well, it presents a model of a 4D cosmology that comes close to being UV completable within string theory. It's four -dimensional, a five-dimensional semi-classical gravity, and that provides the uplift of, well, of, of, that provides a completion of a 4D cosmology, basically. Furthermore, this model is kind of coming out of the swamplet. It uses swamplet ideas to construct an effective decitter space. It's just the decay of a false ADS-5 vacuum, and that decay must be mediated by a brain, and you live on that brain. Okay, that's the conceptual idea. And this string theory inspired brain world, it offers you a pair of glasses, a different pair of glasses. Okay, you can look at things from the bulk, you get a higher dimensional view. So that's a duality. What happens on the brain, you find interpretation in the bulk and vice versa. And how you go from one to the other is dictated by the junction condition. The brain is not a separate entity. It is part of a bigger system. And I, that's what the junction condition tells you. And in contrast to the Randall Sundrum brain worlds, okay, neither gravity nor matter will be localized to the brain, but it rather extends holographically. Okay, and a really nice example of this is, I think, pressureless matter on the brain. Okay, as I mentioned, this is, these are just uh, strings that are hanging on the brain. So this is a holographic extension. I think that's one way to look at it. But this higher dimensional view can also help us to understand uh, cosmology or quantum cosmology just a little bit better. So for instance, uh, the Big Bang. So in cosmology, we say, well, we don't know much about it. It's the singularity of my theory. But here up in 5D, there is no Big Bang singularity. Okay, there's nothing to worry about. We even understand the physics behind it. It's just double nucleus. So relating this to quantum cosmology, from the point of view of 4D, 
nucleation of a closed universe is creation out of nothing, but with your high dimensional glasses on, you say, well, it's actually creating in something. And the second issue, also in quantum cosmology, is the choice of boundary conditions. Okay, you need these uh, to supplement as a supplement to the wheel of the wit equation. Okay, we don't know what to take, but what happens in 5D? Well, bubble nucleation. Okay, so the amplitude of the wave function, the wave function of the universe, should match the known amplitudes of bubble nucleation a la Brown title law. And this unambiguously fixes the boundary conditions to be of the Vilenkin type. Okay, it gives you this way thing, the exponent of minus one over lambda. Now, of, of course, I should say this does not solve the quest for initial conditions. Okay, there is, for instance, no answer to the question why is there an unstable ABS in the first place? But still, there are still some interesting things to do with this dark bubble model, and I hope uh, I interested some of you. And if you are having some questions, I can try to give you an answer. Uh, so thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Rob, for the very nice talk. Uh, do you have any questions for him? I have a question, actually. Um, oh, sorry, Mark, were you about to? Yeah, go ahead, Aiden. Okay. Um, right, so, okay, so one of the findings is that the, um, the Vilenkin tunneling probability on the quantum cosmos side, this ends up being intimately related to this uh, bubble nucleation rate from the brown tidal, right in the brown tidal volume process. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what if you, what if say you, you included like a, say a scalar field, say in your five dimensional theory. So now you can start mediating like Coleman de Lucia bubble nucleations, uh, things like, uh, or other types of processes. Like, would this be a viable way to mess with the, um, or to, to change the boundary condition on the quantum cosmology side? Well, um... Coleman de Lucha also has this uh, exponent minus one over lambda scaling. Um, so I don't think it, it would change much, but uh, yeah, we, yeah. only, we, we only looked at uh, the things which are the most natural one for this model. Okay, so we refrain from introducing additional fields. That's, that's also the reason why in the paper that appears last week on archive, we considered uh, gravitational perturbations. Okay, so that, those are the most natural ones to consider, I think. Mm -hmm. But there, there's no like, there's no um, like in, inherent obstruction or anything to like including, say you want to include at some point a scalar field so that like, okay, we widen the mini, with the eye of like widening the mini super, super space to eventually include like FRW histories and things like that. Um, there's no like, there's no fundamental obstruction to doing that, is there? Um, no, I don't think, I think if you want to include scalar fields, you can. Okay. I could just add that the important thing is that you have to find some, some, some source for these fields already in 5D. You cannot just add things in the 4D. You have to know what kind that's of right, uplift yeah. they correspond to. So that, that's an important thing. And that means also that if you want to introduce electromagnetic fields or something like that, you have to know what they correspond to up in five dimensions before you can go ahead and mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question then. So, yeah, I was trying to think about the, what the microscopic picture could be. So you have this interesting uh, effect where the, the brain actually makes it all the way out to the ADS boundary in the, in the Lorentzian geometry. And, and so that's unusual in that you, typically some finite energy kind of field theory dynamics would have uh, like an asymptotic region that would kind of remain asymptotically ADS everywhere. And so I was thinking it, it's maybe suggestive that when, when this brain hits the asymptotically ADS boundary that you need to be doing something time dependent to your field theory at that point, like a, a Lorentzian quench or something where you change some parameters. Is that, is that something that, I, I mean, I guess I, the question is what, 
what have you thought uh, what, in terms of the microscopic description? And would you agree with with that 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 the field theory itself actually needs to be time dependent in some way? I have not thought about these microscopic uh, descriptions actually to to have an honest question, uh, honest yeah. answer to your question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, naively, like at, at first you might think, okay, you you can have a, a field theory that has a metastable vacuum, and and maybe maybe even in the microscopic picture, this corresponds to something like you're in a metastable vacuum, and then and then you have a tunneling kind of thing in 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 the field theory itself. And one option, I mean, often we think about that happening more locally, and then say having a bubble in the field theory. But I suppose if you're at finite volume, I mean, in some in some regime of parameters, you might actually have it all happen everywhere at once. And what you want it seems like more like that situation where you would have some transition that happens everywhere else at, at once in the field theory. But but then I think just that you know, some evolution with an ordinary field theory Hamiltonian, um, again, that sounds like it wouldn't correspond to what you're saying, because I don't think that would have something actually making it out and changing the asymptotics at this particular time. So. I don't know, maybe interesting to consider if there's some kind of, uh, you, you know, abrupt change of parameters or something. That would be a, a Lorentzian kind of quench. And, and that sort of thing can, you know, can be reflected in, in an actual change, an actual um, difference from just asymptotically ADS. Yeah, I think we can think about it, but at this point, I, I cannot say much about this. Uh, Okay. Yeah. I mean, anyways, it's, it seems very interesting to think about if, if, yeah. if there's some microscopic uh, thing. And I mean, you, you know, you have the geometry and it's asymptotically ADS before the bubble and afterwards. And so, you know, just standard ADS CFT suggests uh, at least some parts of the picture, just the, the place where the bubble reaches the boundary seems a little mysterious. Do we have any other questions for Rob? Okay, let's thank him one more time. Thanks, very interesting. Thank you.